Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome Corey Forsyth. He's uh, an adjunct faculty from the ITP program at NYU. He's also an expert at Ember.js. Uh, he helped out the Fuse Labs group uh, at MSR with some work that we were doing over in New York City with uh, Katie London. And he's come here today to share some of his knowledge about Ember.js. Thank you, Corey. Thanks. I'm here. Nice to meet you all. My name is Corey Forsyth. Um, I'm Bantic on Twitter, and I run a consulting company in New York called 201 Created. Uh, anyone have an idea why we're called that? Very close. Close? That would be Jersey, which is very close. It is the, it's the HTTP status code for uh, creating a new object. Yeah, We use that sort of like as a litmus test sometimes for our clients. If, if they can figure it out, then we know we can work with them. Yeah. And as Lars said, we used to be called 404, but that just didn't work out. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, single page applications, sort of like um, go a little bit over like what they are, why, why they're popular now, what, what they do, why we build them, and then specifically talk about my tool of choice, Ember.js, for creating single page apps and what it provides us. And then I'm going to show a little bit about the uh, project that we worked on with Fuse to, uh, to make an Ember application within Microsoft here. <coughs> so. Single page applications, uh, sometimes abbreviated as SPAs. Uh, this, I've, I've had people talk to me about this, and it uh, uh, always surprised me until I sort of figured out what it meant last year. Um, but they are, uh, let's see, so what is a single page application exactly? Um, how does it differ from this? So the typical sort of uh, you know, browser experience uh, that we have had for most of the time that we've had browsers on the web is a, like a call and res response server. Uh, we make a request and uh, sends off some data or a request to the server. The server does a little bit of processing and sends back a full page. So it's very much like a page by page experience. And um, we're, we're sort of moving now into a new mode of being, I think, on the web. Uh, the, the primary part about single page apps is uh, the single page part refers to the fact that we uh, are now able to build web applications that don't rely on page reloads, full page reloads before. It's more of a uh, sort of a long-lived application in the browser. Uh, and a lot of the things that that entails, meaning uh, we start to have to think about memory management and uh, synchronization of data between uh, what we're showing on the client end to what other clients may be creating, and also what's on the back end, stuff like that. Uh, there are a lot of new complexities sort of that this, this brings to the table. Um, we still work within the context of the web, so we have to like manage URL and browser history. And we, uh, um, we think more now, I think, in terms of flows than just in screen. So rather than moving from screen to screen, we think about like a real low latency UI where different actions uh, that the user takes will change other, other things that they see on the screen. It's not simply uh, throwing down all the state to the server and then rebuilding it right back up on the next page request. Uh, here's a example of sort of a uh, canonical uh, single page application. It's a to-do manager at todomvc.com. Uh, this is like the Rosetta Stone, I think, of um, to-do apps and, uh, and application JavaScript frameworks for the front end. Uh, you can see this is the Ember example. They all work exactly the same way. Um, but it shows, you'll see, you can, uh, the top of the screen is a little bit cut off, but you can see how the URL changes as we move around. Um, all this stuff is happening without any server implementation having to happen at all. <coughs> so, um, why, so now that we have an idea of what single page applications are, the question is why, why do we build them at all? What, what do they give us that we don't get uh, normally? And I think there are a few major reasons. A, a very big one is mobile. So a low latency UI, which is what we can have when we don't have to fetch the entire state from the server every time, is um, that's what we get when we can avoid that uh, call response cycle. And uh, especially for mobile where bandwidth is at a real premium and there's high latency between the server, uh, the cloud, and your phone or your tablet, it makes a lot of sense to uh, build an application that can run for a long time 
uh, that can be responsive and snappy. And um, increasingly, I think there's a marketplace expectation now. Uh, users are used to apps getting more and more powerful. They're used to native apps, and so they want to see the same experience on the web. Um, and uh, the reason why we build these in HTML instead of uh, proprietarily, though, in, instead of native apps, is that we can, uh, we can share everywhere. So uh, the project I'm going to show you here here is the same code base, and it works mobile, tablet, web. Um, and we also get to take advantage of uh, a lot of the great things that the open web gives us, like shareable URLs and um, uh, just being able to sort of like see and freely distribute these things, dist distribute updates and stuff like that. Uh, so now that we uh, have a motivation for why we build them and, and what they are, the question is how. Uh, my choice is Ember, and that's what I'll be talking about for a little while now. Uh, if you've seen much about Ember or read about it before, I'm sure you've seen the slogan. It's a framework for creating ambitious web applications. Um, it's pretty much, it's on the front page of the Ember website and something you see pretty much every time you get involved with Ember. Um, it, can, it can sort of like wash over you, I think, if you've seen it too many times, but I think it's worth taking a second to like unpack exactly what that means. Um, so first of all, Ember is a framework. It's unabashedly a framework. The creators, Tom Dale and Yehuda Katz, gave a talk at FluentConf recently called uh, In Defense of Frameworks. And they, they made the case for uh, the fact that, for what, what frameworks bring to the table, and specifically what Ember does. Uh, but the idea is that uh, we are so, sort of all, the similarities between web applications outweigh the differences. Um, and we're all climbing the same mountain. So, uh, Ember really works hard to provide uh, a structure to what you're doing, but also giving you all the tools, all the hooks and stuff like that to modify it to your own needs. And I think we're seeing that, uh, that out in the ecosystem. No one is uh, being constrained by the framework of Ember. And in fact, I'm going to argue in a little bit that the uh, predictability and structure of that framework is actually a very positive thing. The second part is that it is for creating ambitious web applications, uh, which I think is an important word. In, uh, to think about in that slogan. Um, the web is, well, web applications are, are increasingly getting very complex. And I think Ember developers and the Ember framework creators uh, sort of have a healthy respect for that complexity. They're like, originally JavaScript was sort of like a toy language that you would throw on, add to a web page, just sprinkle in a little bit of extra, a um, uh, little bit of extra form validation or like alert messages or something like that. Uh, but increasingly, it's coming in, into its own as a first class language that can be used to build really important and powerful things. And we uh, want to respect that complexity and uh, want to pave over as many of the common challenges as we can so we can really like reach far with our applications and not settle for um, too complicated solutions or uh, sacrificing features instead. Uh, it's a community-driven pro project. It's open source, and uh, it's uh, very much growing. I just came from a conference in Portland, the first major Ember Conf. Uh, it's continuing to grow. These are some of the meetups I was able to find at meetup.com. And uh, it's sort of spreading and getting more and more popular around the world, and I think there's a lot of interest uh, in the Ember community to continue to spread that and help make uh, web developers all over the world more productive. <coughs> all right, first uh, demo I'd like to talk about. So. I'll show a couple of things. Actually, I'm going to skip ahead and show the code for this one because it's so simple. Uh, if you've used an Ember tutorial, you've probably seen something like this before. It's the canonical use case maybe for Ember. Uh, they bind. So what this is showing is we're, it's a little template um, binding a property called name to a text input field and then displaying that same property. This is literally all the code other than uh, maybe like two lines of JavaScript to set up the application. This is the entire code that handles binding those properties from one to the other. I'll show, show how it works here. <coughs> cool. So if I type in my name here, we see it just live updating. Uh, we can change it as much as we want, and it continues to update the value that's shown on the screen. Again, this is, this is sort of one of the very core features that's built into Ember. Uh, you never have to touch jQuery, there's no uh, manual DOM manipulation or anything to do this. And uh, the nice part is that uh, Ember sort of thinks of 
thinks of having like a single source of truth, I suppose, for the data. So there's a, a controller that internally is going to back this and store that property name. And so anywhere that changes that name property, whether it's through user interaction on the client side or through application code uh, as it's running, it's going to instantly reflect all those changes everywhere that property is being used. So this button will set it on in application side code and it will watch the uh, values just immediately propagate to the server. And uh, likewise, as many times, this is just the same template over and over again, it's the same property, without having to do anything else, every other place that it's bound will just automatically update. It's the same code, just repeated uh, four times down below. Uh, cool, so that's a little example of data binding. Another uh, thing I want to show is uh, computed properties. So this is another way Ember sort of, um, as I mentioned, there's like that single sort of truth single source of truth, rather, for properties uh, in code, in the templates, they, and they live in the code. Uh, computed properties allow us to um, maintain the dependencies between different, uh, different, different properties that we have in our app and combine them in logical ways. So for an example, if I want to think about taking a hike today in the Cascades, I, I would say whether it's raining or not, um, as I understand it's sort of a tall the tall order to ask for it not to be raining around here, but uh, we'll say that if it weren't raining, uh, I would want to go, and if it is warm out, I would want to go. I don't, don't want to be too cold, and then I can't go unless I have fuel in the car, uh, but if I do, then now all of a sudden the property has just updated, and I'll, I'll show the code so we can change any combination of these. We'll continue to say no until we get it to the right one here. <coughs> the code for this uh, is also pretty simple. So we're able to use Ember's uh, computed properties, the and and the not, to uh, transform our raw properties, has fuel, is warm, and is raining, into a logical condition called should hike. And um, again, Ember just is, uh, will continue to update the value of should hike every time any of its dependent properties changes. These things sort of cascade through your application. They allow you to write really expressive, um, communicative code, and you very rarely get into synchronization issues where you have to remember to update another dependent property as you change one. <clears throat> All right, so I want to show a little bit more advanced example of data binding. Uh, I mentioned that, that uh, the properties here will just uh, propagate. The, the, I bound a first name property to uh, one text input field and a last name property to the other, and they'll combine. I have them combining to a full name property. Actually, let's do this. Babe. Okay. And they combine to a full name property like that. And uh, Ember allows you to uh, not just read those properties as they're being changed by the, by the user in the interface and, and react to them. You can actually uh, react as they're being set and decompose the uh, computed property here, which is the Abe, Abe Lincoln. If I change it here, you'll notice that the name itself changes. And I'll show you the code for how that works, too. Cool. Um, so now, yeah, our, we have a property called full name, which just combines the first and last, but it functions as both a setter and a getter. And so when it's being set with the new property, when I was changing the uh, combined property there, it uh, was able to decompose the first name and the last name from the component parts and set those properties. And then again, uh, you just set these things in your application code and they propagate to your templates automatically and vice versa. <coughs> Uh, finally, one, one thing that's really nice about Ember is that they're, they're very actively embracing the future of the web. Um, in particular, does anyone, has anyone heard of the Web Components W3C spec? This is a, uh, it's a spec that they're building to, um, it's looking to uh, find more ways to make the web uh, shareable and extensible for web developers. Uh, it's a spec to allow people to write, um, Consult it's like it's mostly based around widgets. So the idea of like a date picker, for instance, would be a good <laughs> candidate for a component which has its own little uh, maybe JavaScript functionality, the way it reacts when you click different things in a small calendar, and it uh, would have a UI that displays this calendar and stuff like that. And they're all sort of combined together. You can imagine wanting to reuse this through a lot of different applications. Um, Ember has is embracing. This is not fully built into browsers yet, but it's being actively specced, and Ember is like looking to the future, and they've sort of made their own polyfill of this to allow people to use it uh, before it's fully ready. All right. 
components. Okay, so I made a uh, component that wraps around all the functionality needed to instantiate and show a Bing map. Uh, so here is our Bing map, and uh, because of Ember's uh, data bindings, we can bind properties into the map and change them live. So if I can, for instance, change the zoom, then the map instantly updates and uh, zoom in here on Microsoft. I can change things that don't relate to the actual map code, like the width of the thing. And then uh, the real power here is because this is a component, all these actions are isolated and contained within the Ember component. So I can just sprinkle it ran or, uh, arbitrarily wherever I would like in my pages. So for instance, when I click this, it's the same map because it's all bound to the same properties, but I'm able to just add it anywhere I want with a little bit of template code once I've defined what the functionality of that is. And I'll, they all uh, behave the same way, so they will all instantly update too when I change that. I'll show that code here. <coughs> cool, so this is just a little snippet from the map component, but uh, Ember has these lifecycle hooks for its components where you can call a, a bit of code as they, when it gets inserted into the DOM. So this, this function create map gets called when we call data insert element. Uh, it calls out to the Microsoft Bing Maps um, Ajax API, sets up the map. And then this update map, uh, it hooks into the data binding and the, and the property chain that I had mentioned before. Anytime any of the dependent properties there, center zoom or map type ID, uh, map type ID was actually not shown, but either uh, if we change the latitude and the longitude or the zoom, it will immediately update the map with the new properties. And so that's how we sort of are able to bind that. And I actually, I have some example code for this that I uh, have shared and uh, people are able to just basically take my code and then they can drop a Bing map component into their own Ember app this way. And uh, Ember's continuing to work on sort of capturing and, and encapsulating this stuff so it becomes more shareable between Ember apps. Uh, and this is the template part. I just have to specify that I'm using the Bing map component and then I can bind in any values that I want. So I'm, I'm reading a zoom value in from the, uh, the outside scope and setting it to the zoom of the map. <coughs> cool, so uh, Ember has a lot of small, I've showed you a, like, a lot of little like nifty tricks and the different pieces of Ember that um, make it useful to use, but it wouldn't be that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a framework if it weren't uh, giving you a structure to sort of combine these things all together. So um, Ember really follows in, it's, it's definitely inspired by Rails. The creators of, uh, one of the creators in particular of Ember came from Rails before this, and they have that same philosophy of giving you a lot of good defaults out of the box. It's the convention over configuration sort of um, idea. And uh, Ember, it, uh, it sort of prescribes a lot of things to you, telling you where things should go. I, I'm not gonna say it forces you, but it like very strongly encourages you to use a certain predictable structure. It gives you five sort of basic primitives, uh, uh, routes, which handle uh, serializing your application state as you enter the application, and then controllers, which are the ones uh, that uh, handle showing and reacting to uh, events in your, in your UI, and then models, which are your data properties, views, which react to DOM events like clicking and dragging and stuff like that, and then the templates which actually show what's displayed there. And so uh, Ember gives you all this, like, this very predictable structure and sort of a, a prescription of where all these things should live and how they should interact with each other. Why is it important to have this predictable structure? <coughs> all right, before I answer that question, I'll, I wanna show you a little bit, one more thing, uh, the Ember Inspector is a, an extension for Chrome and Firefox that was recently released. And um, we'll just move right into it here. It allows you to inspect in any, in any app, even a production app, you can inspect uh, an Ember application as it's running. And here is a screenshot of it showing I'm, I'm hovering over in the bottom part, this is the inspector. I'm hovering over uh, one of the templates and the controller and it shows me on the screen uh, what template is actually being displayed there, what controller is using to uh, handle the properties and so on. And uh, the great part about this, oh, let's see, there we go. The great part about this is that uh, because it's a live application, you are able to just uh, use the Ember inspector. Um, as I said, there's a single source of truth for data in Ember, and if I change it in the Ember inspector, it will instantly update in the UI also. So it's, again, it's the same thing. You, you, this was sort of an aha moment for me when I was using Ember. You, it feels a lot more like application development. You 
when you're using it 90% of the time, you're not thinking about how you are interacting. How, you're never like using jQuery to find things or set things. So that it's much more of a, like a declarative sort of formalized structure. It's really nice. And this sort of thing, so I, I said that Ember has a very product, predictable structure. And that's the sort of thing that makes something like this possible. Uh, if Ember didn't have that specified structure, then you wouldn't be able to uh, make like a really high level tool like this that works for all Ember apps and allows you to sort of see them, change them, debug them as they're running. It's really nice. <coughs> uh, the predictability, in addition, uh, it gives you very predictable or at least um, a much smoother uh, ramp for onboarding someone. So anytime you come into an Ember API, you know uh, roughly where you're going to find the files that control the different parts of the UI. If you don't, you just open up the Ember Inspector and it will show you, basically tell you which template controller and route are covering any different part that you're looking. Uh, and it makes it really easy to get very productive fast on a new project to bring new people in uh, and really, really get going. It's a nice, it's a great thing about Ember, I think. <coughs> cool. And so uh, talk a little bit about what Ember development feels like. Um, but first, we should talk about what non-Ember development feels like. Um, so before really using Ember, the I mean, we should say that today is, it's 2014 now, and we still really don't have a package manager for client-side JavaScript on the web. We've got Bower, but it's not uh, by no means like a comprehensive solution. It still requires a lot of manual work to integrate that. And so there's this awareness, I think, that there's still a lot of room that we have to go. The um, tools for doing client-side development have improved a lot, but um, the default still is to throw things into global scope, try to make sure they don't uh, conflict with each other, edit CSS files to match what your JavaScript expects, all this tight coupling between different parts of your application. And so Ember is really uh, trying to leapfrog that, and uh, they're working on the tooling as well as the application structure to sort of get us beyond that to something that works a little bit better. Um, so yeah, as I said, Ember development feels a lot more like first-class app development. They're, they're working on uh, a lot of good tooling for it, including um, looking forward to ECMAScript 6, uh, syntax as much as possible. They use something called a, an ES6 module transpiler, which allows you to write ECMAScript 6 code, which looks like the way you would actually expect to write real JavaScript programs, or, or any program in any language, which allows you to define a, uh, an object or a class or something inside a file and then export it and then require it from another file. Uh, have people here used TypeScript? So TypeScript is trying to do the same thing, right? It's like, it's um, there's, unfortunately, TypeScript's module syntax and ES6 module syntax are not the same, but I believe in 1.1 one, one of TypeScript, they are going to try to converge to be the same. And I think that'll be a really uh, important point to, to sort of like, TypeScript will really come into its own as, in regards to working within the greater ECMAScript 6 community at that point. But anyway, writing, writing Ember apps feels a lot like that, where you write your code, you write your class, uh, your model class in one file, you write your route class in another file. If you need one in the other, you just import it and use it. And then um, Ember has a nice build pipeline that runs through uh, Grunt, runs on Node um, to uh, build all the files and sort of gives you that all out of the box. Feels a lot like iOS app development because you've got, or um, Windows Presentation Foundation, or what, is that right? Yeah. I haven't uh, used it myself, but I've been told that it offers a lot of the same data binding and like controller and action handling um, that Ember does. Uh, so if you, if you use that, Ember may be uh, familiar or um, fun for you to use also. Uh, but so Ember is really looking toward the future, and uh, I think they have a, a pretty good line on sort of like where things are going and how to converge on that to really make, make application development on the web feel like real application development rather than just sort of messing around. Uh, there are a lot of companies that use Ember now. There are many more uh, that, are, that are not listed on this slide. It's a growing community. Um, these are just a few of some of the headliners. Um, there are more all the time, and uh, as of about a month ago, also Microsoft Research uses Ember. Um, I, to my knowledge, it may be the first uh, publicly deployed Ember app from Microsoft. I'm not sure if there are others. Um, great, yeah, so uh, I hope there will be more. Uh, it's ours, the one we made is called herehere.co, made it with two of the people in this room, Lars and Imad. Um, here, here. Uh, did anyone see here, here at the Tech Fest demo? It was about a month ago. Okay. So here, here takes 311 data from NYC, which is a 
311 is the number we call for non-emergency public issue reporting, something like a street light out, a uh, fire hydrant missing, a uh, graffiti or a pothole. And uh, it runs it through uh, another project from Fuse called the Sentient Data Server, which is a, a something that maps data to emotions. Um, we take all the public 311 data that the city gives us, uh, normalize it, sort of run it through the Sentient Data Server, and it spits us out emotions for different neighborhoods based on what they have seen happening. So if there was like a lot of graffiti uh, today that there wasn't yesterday, the Upper East Side might be particularly upset about that. Um, yeah, I feel like the Upper East Side has a very stodgy personality, so it would get like fussy and upset, whereas in the Lower East Side, if there were a bunch of street lights out, they'd get angry. And so they're much more gritty and hardcore down there. We take all these things and we build daily uh, neighborhood statuses out of it. And I'll sort of walk you through a few things. Uh, the client side, this is here, here. The client side UI is all built in Ember. Um, and it, I think it allowed us, we had a lot to do in this project from, um, there's a lot of data work, a lot of big data sort of um, high data hygiene work to do with bringing in the 311 data, running it through the Sentient Data Server. And so um, we wanted to be able to iterate very quickly on the front end as we explored different ideas for generating neighborhood statuses and stuff like that. And Ember allowed us to uh, sort of define a URL structure and allow us to change different pieces in it pretty quickly. So we sort of Halfway through the project, we really did a big refactor of, of the sort of data we were showing and how we were displaying it. And Ember uh, allowed us to handle that pretty easily. Um, it manages all the URLs for you. So as you move around and move to a different neighborhood, you'll see that the neighborhood changes up here. Um, that's nice because it allows you to ch share these things very easily. If you refresh the page, then it will come right back to the one you were at because it, because it uses the native web URL. Um, <clears throat> for something like this about page where we've we've got this map living in the background for performance reasons we don't want to tear down this map and rebuild it every time we if we're only simply switching from one screen to another and the map lives below it so our routing structure uh, has a route that comes in builds up the map and then shows the about page and that route is the parent of the neighborhood routes also so they seamlessly can move back and forth it won't rebuild that uh, code so performance and it uh, makes it easier for things like mobile where it really matters uh, re-downloading re all of those tiles. <clears throat> cool, yeah. So uh, I mentioned a bunch of these things. We also were able to encapsulate a lot of client-side authentication through Ember. Ember uses uh, the JavaScript concept of promises. Uh, it's a way of managing asynchronous behavior without having to nest in a lot of callbacks. Um, a promise represents an eventual value so that you can, you can use promises as though they are roughly, you can sort of lay out your code roughly as though it were synchronous, but they will actually sort of uh, move from one step to another um, with asynchronous action happening in between. It's, an, it's a powerful abstraction. It's not unique to Ember, but Ember um, was maybe sort of a, a front-facing leader in sort of bringing it into their framework, and they definitely use it for all of their asynchronous behavior. Uh, but it allows us to manage uh, something like a uh, client-side login pop-up that pops up a window, allows you to go in there, forget your password, uh, try to sign in a couple times, and finally complete it before it closes. Uh, and that's managed just through a single uh, line of JavaScript on the client side. While it, it basically says, while I'm waiting for this promise to finish, uh, do nothing, and then con continue. And it gives us a lot of nice abstractions that allow us to do things like that fairly easily um, and allows us to add a bunch of other uh, authentication strategies without having to change our application code. Uh, in addition, Ember has a really nice testing story. These are our tests, some of our tests running. Stuff like this also helped us uh, refactor. Um, Ember is increasingly putting focus on uh, making the testing primitives nice and easy to use. Um, but uh, the ones that are there now are still pretty good, and they allowed us to, as I said, we had this big refactor halfway through, and a lot of this allowed us to keep the uh, complex client-side interactions between different parts of the page uh, working while we changed other parts of the application code. Makes things pretty easy. So earlier I asked who, who uses Ember, and uh, I hope that at the end of this talk, uh, you are at least inspired to check it out, and uh, maybe uh, the next person to use Ember will be you. So. Thanks a lot.
open up for questions. Yeah. Can you compare Ember with Knockout, which seems to do similar <coughs> sorts of things? Sure. Uh, yeah, actually, Knockout is one of the few frameworks I really have very little experience. I probably should have looked at more because I know it's very popular within Microsoft. Um, Knockout also has data bindings, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Would it? Would Knockout be more of a library or a framework? Sort of a little. Both? It's. It's. I think of it as an MVVM framework. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. I guess I don't really know a whole lot about it. I know that Ember really tries to be very incredibly comprehensive, like it does as much as it possibly can for you. Um, it probably goes further than Knockout does um, in terms of things that you would have to solve, problems it would leave for you to solve. But yeah, I don't really know too much. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the Ember uh, uh, with regards to scalability. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it working here, here, but I'm interested, do you know of any applications or bigger size application that takes a lot of traffic that can and support that, like uh, when the application, web application grows and has like, so many routes and components, and controllers does it work well? Right. Or do they have issues around that? Um, no, this is. I mean, this is definitely something that the Ember folks are working on a lot. Is making that easy. So one thing that they're spending a lot of time doing now is actually improving the build pipeline. So I mentioned that you you write Ember more like a real application with files that all live separately and sort of like logically contain their. Uh, functionality, but then they all have to get combined. I mean, we're still working in the web, so you end up you want to end up with one big concatenated JavaScript file, and it takes a long time to rebuild that pipeline. So there's a lot of work now going on to make that very fast. When you get to tens, like thousands of files, it can really slow down. So, but I think it's going to get a lot faster with it. They have a new you know, tool called Broccoli, which takes trees of uh, of data sources and then combines them intelligently and quickly. Uh, as far as uh, structure, I I'm not sure of, of the best example of a really large, complicated app. Um, yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what the most complicated ones are. But the, some of the ones I showed, there's, I think Square's app is fairly complicated. Um, the company that funds, or the, the consulting company that the creators of Ember have, Tilde, they have a product called Skylight, which is a uh, performance monitoring tool that has a lot of complicated routes, I believe. Um, so they don't yeah. get run into issues where like the, the browser consumes a lot of memory and ah. stuff like that. Oh, that that size. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not totally sure. I do know that um, they are working in, on intelligent route loading, mm -hmm. so that's that's one of the new things that's going to come to Ember, um, which makes a lot of sense because the way like the way an iOS app would work is you would download the entire thing one time, and then you could run it forever. Mm -hmm. But web apps, you're basically downloading the entire app every time you visit that page. And so they're working a lot on being able to easily split those parts about. So you wouldn't load up any of the admin routes, for instance, if you weren't an admin user or until you visited that part. Um, I think that will help a lot with memory management. Just the, the data bindings themselves, I think, actually make a lot of that stuff easier. It's a lot harder to um, accidentally create a leak when Ember is managing, managing that memory for you already. You, know? yeah. you don't have to manually do it. Uh, what are your thoughts around mobile development? So we're doing some work with uh, Cordova. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you showed the, the Ember Inspector, which looked really interesting. Yeah. Um, where is that in terms of mobile development? Is that? I know that there are uh, several applications that, that people are building that use PhoneGap. Is Cordova and PhoneGap yeah. the same? Yeah. Um, to package them up and distribute them. There's a company that, whose entire uh, per, uh, they're in, yeah, their entire company basically runs on building apps through PhoneGap. It's called the app, and they allow people to generate their own apps uh, through a like a drag and drop user interface online, and it packages it up into an Ember app, runs that through PhoneGap, and actually makes it something available that you can download uh, through app distribution channels. Um, and so I I think that they because it's their core business, they've spent a lot of time optimizing for mobile, um, and there are a lot of people in general that are optimizing for mobile like. Ember, because it has that repeatable structure, it gives you the ability to, to share common solution patterns. So for instance, they, there's a lot of stuff that involves uh, virtualizing list views um, that you can share. And that was built because handling 10,000 like DOM list nodes in, in mobile is pretty tough. Uh, and so it will, it will automatically manage hiding them, removing them from DOM as they move out of screen, or reusing them, uh, at, like reusing table cells as they shift off. Popping them back on the bottom with the new thing and stuff like that. So, um, 
yeah, I think that story is going to continue to improve with Ember. One more question. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I know we, we talked a couple months ago, and at one point you had uh, tried to use TypeScript, and you said it wasn't quite compatible yet. So would your recommendation on that just to be kind of hold off for TypeScript 1.1 before kind of trying to do Ember and TypeScript together? I, th I think maybe the, the um, there are maybe two things that make TypeScript a little bit tough. One is that the, the static type checking that TypeScript gives you, um, Ember, Ember uses like the, uh, what's called a uniform access principle for, its, um, for getting properties from different pieces of the application. You ask for it by like a path name. And I think the TypeScript compiler is going to be, it's going to be really difficult for it to uh, infer what type of property is going to come back from that, because it, it would have to introspect a string, and the string could be dynamically created. Um, so that part of it will be sort of tough. But I think, um, as I understand it, the IntelliSense will still work well in terms of just giving you what parameters and functions are available to you at times. So that'll help. Um, but then, yeah, the TypeScript, the compilation, as I understand it, has basically two modes. It's like a node mode, where it says, I'm going to take TypeScript files um, make them into common JS style individual files for export um, or web mode where it does the compilation but also then the build process for you. And um, I've, I, the last time we tried to use it, it, it creates anonymous AMD modules which do not work well with Ember because Ember expects to be able, it can work with AMD modules. That's the way it actually transpiles down, but it needs them to be named so it can resolve them. It uses dependency injection pretty heavily, so it looks up a lot of these. Uh, dependencies at runtime or as it's going. And so that part, I think, is the most complicated. Um, we actually, in our work, we released an open source uh, compilation uh, step for TypeScript that runs through like the grunt build pipeline. But it's, it's still hard. Yeah, I wish, it were, I wish it were easy to use. We actually really enjoyed using TypeScript, but we had a little bit of trouble with it for that reason. Yeah, yeah. I think it will be when TypeScript modules match uh, JavaScript ECMA 6. It should actually be really easy to use, I think. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, question. Yeah. Um, are, are there any um, like server-side integration hooks or anything in Ember.js that make it more or less attractive to use certain server-side frameworks, or as long as you have a well-defined API, it doesn't really matter? Yeah. Um, so Ember Data is the official like uh, data layer solution for Ember. It's the least complete of the Ember ecosystem, partially because I, I would say it's the hardest part to get perfectly right in a generalized way. Um, it has, it does work pretty well, but it is very, it is the most opinionated part of the Ember ecosystem in terms of like how it expects things to work and be structured. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of concerns that come up when you're fetching data in terms of keeping them in sync when you have dependent resources. If, if uh, a post has many comments and a comment changes, does the post also become dirty? What needs to get sent back to the server? When new data is coming in through like web sockets or something like that, how do you make sure that everything stays in sync? So that's hard. Um, and Ember data does give you sort of like a paved happy path, but it is pretty narrow at the moment. Um, they're getting a lot better at, at giving you uh, hooks to normalize and transform like JSON responses from a server so you can sort of work with an API that you don't own, transform it into the responses that expect. But it's, it's definitely um, a hard part. It, it, Gives you, I would say, all the hooks necessary to do it, but it is a bit hard. Yeah, this is their. They are perpetually this far from like a 1.0 official release. Um, it, I'm sure it will happen, uh, and it's not too far off. Um, but they've been sort of on the cusp for a while, I think, because they're working really hard to try to get it right. And when the, when it is released, I think it'll be really good. Yeah. Can you talk about the role of community here? Are they? Contributing only to the framework? Are there packages the way Node has packages that are community generated? Right, yeah. Um, there are definitely, there's a sort of a small ecosystem of packages. There are a lot, there are a fair number of um, really popular and common ones like internationalization libraries, form validation libraries, um, there's some authentication libraries, um, and those are, those are shared. But like, as I said, it's still even. The best we have, I think, for sharing this stuff is still Bower, the package management system, which is really just a download tool. You know, it doesn't actually integrate it into your app. Um, but I think this will be a thing that comes pretty quickly, and Ember is um, a, a good plug-in system. So they already have sort of like a, a, bare, a basic one, where you can add your own dependency injections, like uh, register a service, 
uh, set an initializer um, function on your application that will set it up and add it to the parts of the app that it needs. Um, but it's not totally automatic. It still requires a little bit of manual support. Um, probably the most excitement in the community is still around the framework and like ironing out things, particularly uh, it's, it's moving into the periphery, though, I would say. So like the build pipeline is getting really popular. People are doing a lot of work there. Um, testing strategies and tools are uh, getting a lot of interest right now. Um, and then, yeah, I think the next sort of layer is, is sooner or later we'll have this like explosion of like plugins. Once, once the components, as I said, the components really encapsulate functionality. So in theory, they're very easy to, to sort of spread and take one from another place and use it in yours. And that's, I think, where we're going to see a lot of of things happening. There's, there's a pretty good, there are probably like maybe a couple dozen or something like 30, 40 good libraries out there that have reusable uh, solutions packaged. But I think we'll see a lot more pretty soon. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Kurt. Cool. Appreciate yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>